maybe they are, um, but it's always good to challenge that. Just ask that a little bit. So again, I wanna make sure that folks are seeing. So I see, Andy, you're the only guy I see on the screen here right now. Hi, Andy. And uh, could, you, could you give me a thumbs up if you are seeing my screen, the shared screen, you see that slide? Oh, that's so great. The way my morning's been going, I was expecting a big thumbs down. So thanks very much. And I hope you're not just being nice about that. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one here. So this is, it's kind of a silly slide. Not everyone's going to sixth grade camp. So what really got me into on this talk, and we started this talk with um, a, a California Native Plant Society chat that did last March and was asked to do it the previous year. So I've been thinking about this for a little while. Um, you know, things have changed in the business. When I was growing up, everybody went to camp. Everybody went to sixth grade camp. You know, we had folks that when, uh, when they showed up at say East Bay Regional Parks for a field trip or any other place that I was working for a field trip, these people had been out in a park before. They had had experience and we're gonna assume that it was a positive experience. So we assumed a certain level of understanding and ease. And what I began to realize that no, not everybody has done that. And that's probably always been the case. But as you folks probably learned over the years that we've had a lot more screen time, kids spending a lot more time inside, not as much people going out, things like that. And that we had to switch gears. We had the idea, this orthodoxy that everybody who showed up had a certain level of comfort and understanding. It wasn't the case. So our goal came from, our, our goal changed from building upon an assumed comfort to just making this experience positive. This has gotta be a positive experience. So that when these folks leave the park, they've gotta think of this as a positive place that they want, to which they want to return with their families and with their friends. And that identification of what is a positive experience is gonna be different from everybody. And it wasn't uniform. So folks who have been in the park business for a long time, um, you're aware of Frederick Law Olmsted, a landscape architect. And he was the one that put together, that was called on by President Lincoln to put together the first management plan for Yosemite and the Mariposa Grove. And, you know, he had all kinds of great landscaping ideas, um, you know, making trails and things like that and preserving areas and such. It was a relatively good idea, but what really was remarkable about Olmsted is that he saw this place, this Yosemite, as a place where everything changes. That when you go in there, regardless of if you are a rich industrial magnate, if you are somebody who is a, a struggling farmer, that everybody's gonna have that similar experience. There's gonna be this common experience where everybody is just wowed and awed at a certain human level by what experiencing and that that should be open for everybody. That people were afforded an experience that used to be an exclusive thing. And it was in, in Olmsted's mind is like, this is too important. We need to have this available for everybody. And that was a huge change. That's what started off the way national parks as Ken Burns called America's greatest idea. But this is something that Olmsted really set in the place that was something new and different from, you know, boxing or, or um, uh, hunting preserves and uh, places of the landed gentry, where other folks who are not so well, um, who are not so economically well off, were not allowed to go, and Olmsted saw that that was not the way forward. Um, I don't know if anybody's I've heard of Joe Sachs. Joe Sachs was. Um, uh, an attorney and a law professor at uh, University of Michigan and then later on at University of California. And he wrote this book. Has anybody ever heard of the book, um, Mountains Without Handrails? Uh, yeah, that was a real game changer for me that um, his, his take was, you know, not everything can go on everywhere. That you, you know, that you don't have um, cable cars to the top of Half Dome, and that you need some places where people can still have the experiences that Olmsted was talking about, but maybe on a little deeper and greater level. 
you know, where can some things happen and where can some, or is it just not appropriate for some of those things? He was really famous um, in a 1960s court case about Mineral King in the South Central Sierra where Disney wanted to come in and put together a huge resort and ski area and such. And um, the court case essentially said that, look, you could, you could do that kind of stuff in the mountains, but you can't do it everywhere just because you want to. And another thing about that court case was that it showed that the Sierra Club, who wanted to sue to stop the development in Mineral King, the court says, you have no standing in this. You can't sue. This is, it has no, um, you have no bearing on this. It has no bearing on you. But the court said individuals could sue to stop this. And that really hammered home the idea that these landscapes were important to individual people and that they had the standing to determine what was, going, what was going to happen there. So again, we're starting to see these big sea changes in uh, how people view the landscape and how this to be managed going forward. A quick aside, I was this guy was teaching um, uh, law over at Berkeley when I was there in my grad school days. And I was asked by my professor to go up and take a class from him, but I should talk to him about it first. So uh, it was all about endangered species and preservation and such. And so I was in the forestry department. You know, it's like September or October and I'm in a tank top and a pair of shorts and, and, and Birkenstocks at the, the forestry department. I had to walk across campus up to the law school. And this we're talking about a metaphorical stroll. It's all the way across campus. I walk into the law school and there is nobody wearing shorts and flip flops and tank tops in the law school. I go up to Professor Sachs's office and I knock on the door, I go in. And it's a classic old school lawyerly wood panel thing with volumes of books and court cases all over the place. And his assistant looks me up and looks me down. And she says, Professor Sachs, we'll see you now. And I go in and he's sitting in a suit just like this and with a bow tie and the white shirt and starch and everything. And he turns around and he looks at me and he's like, oh, yeah, just, how can I help you? And I ended up, that actually ended up being in a great way because when I took this class, it really opened up my eyes as to why it is that preservation is important and how there are so many different ways to go about it. And maybe that was one of the eye openers is that I started to think there are a lot of different ways to look at these things and that it's not just one orthodoxy. Now, one of the very interesting things is kind of a cruel irony, that kind of a cruel irony, it's a definitely a cruel irony that when we, Think about a place like Yosemite. You know, John Muir went there and uh, wrote these incredible stories and, and such about how fabulous the place should, is and how it should be preserved. Is that, um, and for the good of the people, for you to go to the mountains and, and get their pleasures and their blessings and such. But this idea was that we annihilated you know, a lot of multitudes of cultures and peoples that were already living that four sense of that Olmstead idea and Muir's ideas for thousands of years. But for some reason, we had to pluck those folks out from nature so that we, the royal we, can go back in and reach and reap those benefits. We were, we took a gear out of, I'm sorry, we took a cog out of the gear, the system that was working that gave us that snapshot of Yosemite in the late 1800s, early 1900s that had been going on for thousands of years, hundreds of years, thousands of years, and that we took that cog out of that gear, the human cog, and we expected it to remain the same. And we realized that that's not really the way that things run. And so this idea of separating humans from nature was another orthodoxy that suddenly happened and that we're bumping up against yet again. Should we really do that? Are people part of that landscape or are they separate from that landscape? In our business interpretation, um, there's a fellow named Freeman Tilden who's kind of a big guru about um, the six um, principles of a good interpretive program. This guy went around to national parks back in the late 50s and I think even in the early 60s. And he looked at ranger programs and some of them were fabulous and moving and others were just dogs, just terrible. And of course he wrote his letters to the National Park Service saying so. And they said, look, 
why don't you go on a tour, find out about these places, figure out what makes a good program a good program and what makes a bad one a bad one. And he came up with six principles that we were just like bang, 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 always been nailed into us over the years. And I always forget them. So, but of the two that I remember, one of them is the very first one. And that is that any interpretation that does not somehow relate what is being displayed or described. So whatever you're talking about or trying to share, if you're not relating that to something within the personality and experience of the visitor, it will be sterile. It may be great information, but you're not gonna make that connection. And interpretation is all about connecting people to that resource. And then the fourth one, which I love, is that the chief aim of interpretation is not instruction, but it's provocation. That we are trying to provoke people to thinking about how they connect to this landscape, to this part. And if you think about it that way, you realize that people do it in very different ways. You know, you can compare that to Olmsted and how the parks just bestow wonder upon you. They're just magnificent and they bestow wonder upon you. If you just stay still, it will come to you. Tilden is, was a little bit different and that he was like, you gotta make that connection. What is it about the, the everyday life and the experience of these people that connects to this place. There's a deeper, richer meaning and connection that we can make. And that, um, that as we look at changing demographics, uh, we look at people who want to use the parks in different ways from you know, mountain bikers to, um, you know, uh, we, we see, how do we, how do we connect people to these parks? Where I live in Oakland, um, there's a high school mountain biking team that is the first foray for folks who love to ride bikes, they love to be social, but it's, it got a chance for them to get outside and interact in parks. And there's a big push to put get girls out there too. So these are avenues of connecting people. And are these now, is this an appropriate way for us to steward these resources? And I'm not saying it is or it isn't, but we're now at a place where we're bringing generations of folks uh, who have just not really been comfortable are used to valuing being outside. We want to bring them back outside. And how do we go about doing that? A little closer to home, you know, in the 50s and 60s, uh, you know, we're jumping around here from subject to subject because this is kind of how this thing has been going on in my mind that just bounces from one thing to the next. But, you know, in the 50s and 60s, when the Bay Area was, uh, was uh, just booming and people were filling in the Bay, and uh, garbage dumps were on the bay. Folks were looking at this, like the three women who started Save the Bay. Um, and concurrently, about the same time when, when Rachel Carson was uh, doing her studies and realizing that um, we were having great impacts on ecosystems that were going to impact the way that we live um, just through our everyday behavior. And so I think of it as that we were bumping in to these limits, these Western expansion limits um, of manifest destiny. Go West, young man, go West. We had this idea of it being the limitless West, just endless um, resources, endless horizons. And we realized that really wasn't the case. And that our that idea of manifest destiny was kind of running low on gas. And so we, were, we found a challenge. What is it that we now do do we expand conservation beyond big swaths of national parks and wilderness areas and broaden that interpretation a bit? Um, East Bay Regional Parks, where I work, was a little bit of a part of that. 1934, um, there was a, a referendum to purchase what was called excess watershed lands up in the hills around Oakland and Berkeley and turn them into a park uh, district serving um, Alameda County at the time, or Alameda Contra Costa County. And um, these, were, these were parks that were up in the hills and they were kind of traditional parks. You know, they had redwoods and oak forests and uh, savannas and things like that. And uh, the key here was to buy this excess land to keep it from being developed and keep it open for people near an urban area. And that was kind of a new thing, but it was still up in the hills. Um, and it had that traditional look and it was really strongly influenced by the National Park Service model. We started to expand out to Eastern Contra Costa County, Eastern Alameda County and buying big swaths of land, grassland parks. 
And for a lot of folks, that idea was that parks equal trees and trees equal parks. And if you have grasslands out there, that's not really a park. And I remember going to a meeting of an advisory committee and introducing some of our brand new grassland parks and the shock on people's face was just like, oh my gosh, we just bought a parking lot. We just bought a paved thousand acre chunk. They didn't really see exactly the value of this because that orthodoxy said, going to the park means we're going to the woods and that trees are the escape from the, the paved urban areas where many of us live, and even the suburban areas where many of us live. And so having to change that and to show the value in these very different things um, allowed us to really broaden the understanding, not just of how people use parks, but how different landscapes provide different ecosystem services. Um, so we had those more wildernessy open parks um, and seemingly contradictory to some of the ideas of you know, getting out in nature and being on your own and um, having it speak to you, connect with you. We also have these ideas of directed parks where it's not a city park, um, but you have a very guided experience. You have a paved trail or two that takes you to a very specific spot that meets your objectives or goals of showing people and sharing with people what those resources of the park are. It's relatively small. This is a picture of Big Break Regional Shoreline where I work. There's a big map of the delta that you can walk on out there. So this is kind of the antithesis of that Olmstead report. Go out there, be wowed by the landscape. This was more of like, come on out, take an easy walk. You bring your bike, you could bring your wheelbarrow, you could cart your fishing gear out there, you could bring your kid on a stroller, whatever you want, once, once, once. You could also get to um, um, right to the edge. Right to the edge. Of more, of more. Um, oh, somebody have there. Somebody have there. One echoing here. Okay. Yeah, the mic open. I'll slide and I'll go over quickly. You can develop. Um, okay. Here we go. You can do contingency of operation. I don't know if anybody's got that one. If anybody can see that they've got their mic open. Anyway, we'll go. We'll go ahead and muscle on through this one. Anyway. This was kind of a graded approach that East Bay Regional Parks that had traditionally had these huge swaths of land that had big trees had gone now to grasslands and now we're making these smaller, very directed parks as kind of an entry level park. Very popular, but it took a little bit of convincing for some folks. And this was really following along this guy. If anybody remembers Phil Burton, he was a fiery um, representative, uh, a congressman from San Francisco and his legacy, as far as parklands go, was go and get national recreation area and the whole idea of national recreation areas, the National Park Service providing that kind of amenity close to people. So he's bringing parks to people, but not just city parks. These are big landscape parks not, and not people that had to go across the state to meet a park. We brought the state, the park across the state to meet the people. And these, this is a recognition by the, by the National Park Service that there are these worthy landscapes that existed near population centers where they were working human landscapes, where people were a part of that landscape for um, a century or more in, in Eurocentric cultures, but for thousands of years before with Native American culture. So just think of, of this kind of a reverse from what we thought about pulling Indians out of Yosemite Valley at first. These are not untrammeled lands. These are not wilderness areas, but they are of great value as park lands. We've got a lot, of, you folks are all landscape managers, park people, things like that. Um, and it's tough, you know, you have, you have set goals, you have set park philosophies and things like that. And somebody comes up with an idea to do something and, you know, you think to yourself, how on earth could anyone think that is a good idea? And I might suggest that you ask, how on, how on earth can anyone think that's a bad idea? That when we start to look, we're, if we're set on a point of view, when it comes to park management and parks and conservation, we're set on a view and that we constantly bump into people who don't agree with that view. Why is that? Why is that happening? 
If our view is so clear and so right, why is it that folks who are very smart on the other side of our argument or on the different sides of our argument, why is it they think differently? And um, that leads us to vegetation management. You know, you think about all the stuff that we've had going on with our fires recently. And we're hearing a lot more about traditional uses and impacts of fire on the land. What do we do? Do we let it burn? Do we harvest um, uh, some of these trees? How do we manage this thing? You know, in, in the East Bay Hills, it's eucalyptus for us. And boy, talk about a tinderbox. Not, not just literally that they could they could burn very quickly, but also um, figuratively, and that people have a real connection to these things. I'm not a huge fan of eucalyptus trees myself. Um, I could definitely um, see why we want to, there are good reasons to remove eukes and slowly bring it back to a more native habitat. But I also have this other part of me that remembers walking through this very grove that you see in this picture um, with my son in his little snuggly when he was just a little baby and we were walking through this grove and the wind was blowing and the trees were swaying back and forth and squeaking and creaking and such. And I looked down at him and he just looked around this absolutely mesmerized look on his face taking all this in. And I would just always remember that as an incredibly valuable experience that I had. And that when we look, team that up with this idea that trees equals parks and we're trying to convince folks that no, we should take these trees out and you know, for a multitude of different reasons. Once we understand that there are different ways of looking at this, not that trees are sacred, but folks have a lot of different ways of looking at trees. Um, not that trees are bad, eucalyptus trees are just awful, we should get rid of those things. But people have different reasons for thinking that maybe they should be removed or replaced or thinned. Um, and another thing that the trees teach us is a time horizon. How did we get here? Eukes have been around the state for what, 150, 160 years? How, it took us 160 years to get here. We've got to start making time plans, time horizon plans that kind of match that going forward. And that's not easy. That's not easy to do if um, we want to consider that because writing out a you know, strategic plan for a hundred year period, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Um, grazing. I'm sure a lot of folks have different points of view on this one too. This is really fascinating. Um, and that there's this idea that, you know, what was California like, um, say, you know, before the gold rush or even before any European incursion here, you would have elk, pronghorns, um, munching, grazing, browsing along the landscape, and then here comes a grizzly bear and they all run, take off to another place. So they disturb one area by grazing and being there, walking around and such. And then they run up to another one and they disturb that area a little bit. So there's this moderate disturbance regime idea. And then we got to a point where we, we fenced off cattle, we fenced off sheep, and we grazed like crazy there. We came up with this idea of them being hooved locusts. Is it just that the grazing itself is good or bad, or is the grazing a tool that's not absolute. It's like a hammer. You, know, you can use a hammer to build a house, you can use a hammer to destroy a house. It's how are you going to use that? And you know, some people look at uh, cattle, East Bay Regional Park District, we graze cattle on two thirds of our land and use it for vegetation management, for habitat enhancements, for uh, revenue generation. And a lot of folks look at cows on the hillside and that tells them they're in a park. This is the pastoral, rural setting of the East Bay that they, the reason they came to live here. And other folks look at it as this is the next big cow pie I'm gonna step in or the next big rutted trail to try to ride my bike over. Um, this job. Folks, you know, one of the things that really kind of opened up my mind about grazing, okay. some studies that were done in the Central Valley uh, about vernal pools, and folks, to get the cattle out of the vernal pools because of endangered species like tiger salamanders and fairy shrimp, where they get frogs and things like that. And so um, as vernal pools were closed off, we saw that continued trajectory of declining populations. And so some folks thought, look, you know, is grazing really bad? Is that the problem? And so some studies were done to fence off some vernal pools 
and leave others open for grazing. And it turns out that a lot of the results in the study show that the grazed vernal pools were richer in habitat diversity and greater in habitat, in, not habitat, but in uh, species diversity and in species num uh, absolute numbers. And like the perception was that, look, if you if the thing just is, doesn't have that that engine, that motor that grazes and pulls out plants, you get this classic old school succession. Plants start to grow in there. The pool shrinks in space. It shrinks in time because of evapotranspiration. The little bit, of, the smaller bit of water that's left warms up faster. It's not as friendly to amphibians. So it just required a little bit of a stretch of the mind of, you know, is this appropriate to do grazing or not? And again, the stuff that I'm saying here, I'm not saying that one's good, one's bad, but you can see that there are some real challenges to some particular, or, some particular orthodoxies that we just might have in how we go about managing our land. Um, we talked a little bit about gradations and parks. You know, are we, are we a wilderness park area? Are we a, um, a more of a conservation oriented area? Are we an urban park? Are we a kind of a directed park? Are those the only three kinds? Is there something in between? Are parks actually a broad spectrum and not a particular thing? And that broad spectrum that could um, meet a lot of different social as well as agency and biological objectives. You know, there are a lot of things that connect people to parks that other folks think are not appropriate. Horse packing, rock climbing in certain areas, mountain biking, hunting, trapping, grazing, all this stuff. But it's, it's helped me to think, you know, what is the conservation objective of this particular place? Why do we have this place here? And which human behaviors match that conservation objective? And then we can also look at it as if our objective is to connect people to parks, what are some conservation objectives that we could put in place that matches the behavior that people want to do, want to have and um, explore in parks? When I was sitting in on my first state park ranger interview, this is way back in the 80s, and no, I didn't get the job. Um, I was the last guy, this is down at Silmar, and I was the last guy of the day. And these poor interview panel had been sitting there for eight hours, and it's a Silmar, it's beautiful out the windows. And they were, you know, one of the questions is, you know, why do you think parks are important, blah, blah, blah. And my answer was, parks are for deviant behavior. And I remember this one fellow who was staring out the window, and then as soon as I said that, he perked back up and goes, Parks are for deviant behavior. We're deviating from the things that we do every day when we go to parks. That's why we have them there. So how do we best allow for folks to deviate from their everyday life or their experience so they can come out and incorporate parks into that everyday experience? So it's not just a two-week trip or a one-week trip to Yosemite every year. It's an everyday connection to parks. And we keep thinking about parks, uh, but it's obviously not all about parks. Uh, a lot of this is all about how we match up our park management with people. We've heard an awful lot more about environmental justice, not a new concept at all, but we've heard a lot more about it over the last couple of years. And how do we make our parks more just? And I'm not talking about um, as far as you know, anything from, you know, social views or, um, you know, interactions with police or anything like that. But how do we make them more just in that they fit into that spectrum of different desires for people to connect with the outdoors in a healthy way? So that when people think about the environment, it's a positive thought. It's not a negative thing. How are we connecting people to these places, to these principles? It's also about how people act on the land. Agriculture is a big deal in California. I, I, where I work in the Delta, you know, it's all about water. It's all about water. And in California, you know, 80 to 85% of the water that we have developed, that we dam, that we hold on to, we ship around, we move and canal around, things like that, that's used for agriculture. Um, and people, a lot of folks just think that's terrible. You know, it's only 2% of the economy, but it's 85% of the water. And other folks would say, yeah, 
but it brings us food. It brings us tax dollars. It brings, it solidifies community. So people have a place to work and a place to call home that's stable. So there are a lot of different things, a lot of different things that you could talk about when it comes to agriculture. Um, but how do you maybe reconcile those things? You know, we hear about wildlife friendly farming. You open the north, if anybody's ever driven up Highway 5 or 99 through the Central Valley uh, in the northern part of the state, you'll see flooded fields in the middle of summertime. And some folks will look at that and say, that's terrible. That precious water is getting dumped out into these fields to irrigate rice. And we're not going to see another rainstorm for months. And it's going to evaporate and it's going to be really, it's just going to be a disaster. It's a terrible waste. And then you see flocks and flocks of ibis, uh, geese, ducks, waterfowl, shorebirds flying through there using that area as habitat. And you realize that that's actually recharging groundwater as much as it's evaporating as well. It's, it's wetlands. The whole Central Valley used to be wetlands. And we had this idea of what wetlands are in this great Central Valley that, that now we think is gone. But we see that perhaps these farms might be able to provide the values that we're looking for. Do they do it as well? Is it a great idea to do that everywhere? I, I couldn't say, um, I just couldn't say that. It just depends on the area and what you're looking to do, um, but it does, it could be seen as having great benefit or it could be seen as having great detriment, but understanding that there are different ways of viewing this is agriculture a garden or is agriculture a business? Different ways of viewing this gives us a little bit of an idea of how we might go about managing lands in the future just by understanding what folks are thinking about, how they look at them. Um, the Delta is very much like agriculture. Um, I'm sure a lot of you folks have heard about the tunnel project, everything from the peripheral canal to um, Duke's Ditch, the twin tunnels from Jerry Brown, and now the single tunnel through Gavin Newsom. And um, you know, there's one school of thought that says, just get off the Delta. Just stop taking water out of the Delta and make yourself um, sufficient throughout the state of California. Just do it and everything will be well in the Delta. And other folks will say, well, you know, we've been taking water out of rivers since day one, as far as civilizations go. And it's not that we're doing it, it's how we're doing it. We're diverting water over the top of the Delta in such a way that we're changing the way that rivers are running. We're changing the way that fish have to interact with their habitat. And we're seeing a downward trajectory. And we've seen this downward tra trajectory for going on for 150 years. So if we just put water back in the Delta and let all that water run through, will it mean more fish? And the answer is yes and no. What we found, what the data shows now is that when you put more water back in the Delta, that yeah, it's gonna actually improve fish populations if you do it in the right time, in the right place, with the right temperature and the right amount. And so you'll get this rise in populations. And then after that, it kind of levels off. It's kind of diminishing returns back there. So is there a way to look at this and say, hey, we could use water, we can manage water in such a way that we prioritize wildlife sometimes in a way that we prioritize water use in other times. That's a simplistic way of trying to figure out all the different ways you would do that. But again, when you're locked in as what Mark Reisner, the fellow who wrote that great book, Cadillac Desert, about water use in the Western United States, after he wrote that book, he used to talk about about the gladiators of the West and how people were just gladiators and got to a point that it was all what I say and I will fight for it and nothing will change on my watch. And so they're considered successful if nothing changed. While there was great agreement that if nothing changes, we'll see a downward unsustainable trajectory in places like the Delta. Frank's Tract Futures. This one was fascinating for me. Frank's Tract is a flooded farm, state recreation area in the Delta. It's about 3,000 acres. People have been using it for fishing, for hunting, for recreation for a really long time. But with um, invasive aquatic vegetation moving in and we're seeing endangered species and a lot of invasive species and non-native species coming in, it's really starting to degrade. Interestingly, one of those species, the black bass, largemouth bass, is not native 
but that's what everybody goes there to fish for. And striped bass too, which is also not native. Well, a few years back, the state was charged with saying, look, we got to protect water quality in the Delta and we got to protect endangered species like the Delta smelt and salmon that run through that area. So given those goals, those project goals, the State Department of Fish and Wildlife and uh, State Parks said, okay, we built the plan and they plunked it on the people uh, of Frank's tract. And man, it wasn't pretty, shall we say, because it was gonna change everything for the folks who were there. And they felt really upset about not having any say in this. And they started coming up with all these different ideas. It's like why this plan was not gonna work. It was gonna be a disaster. It was gonna cause levee erosion, we're going to have issues with water quality and all this kind of stuff. And it brought such a human cry that the state pulled the project. They said, that's it. We can't do that. It's just a disaster. To their great credit, the state also said, look, we still have these goals of protecting endangered species and, in, and uh, protecting water quality. Folks of Frank's Track, folks of Bethel Island, which is right next to Frank's Track in this community, here are our goals. UC Davis, the folks that up at UC Davis in the Landscape Architecture Department um, had a system that they wanted to try out. And they went to the, to the stakeholders and they said, look, here are the goals. We're gonna work with you. We would like you to tell us how you think this might work and if it might work. Can we do something to achieve these goals and provide the amenities and lifestyle and economy, recreation that you want in Frank's Tract. And the first meeting was great. I mean, it was pitchforks and torches and everybody's ready to scream and yell. And um, after the first couple of hours, all the folks who got irate left. They were all out, they had said their piece and they had left. They had done their good duty and walked out. But the folks who stuck around, we broke out into groups and we started just asking questions and uh, seeing what people found to be important. It started a whole long two-year process that actually helped guide this plan that is now in, um, it's, it's looking for funding like so many things are, but this idea of adding islands and wetlands and channels and beach areas and recreation spots, providing in the same project habitat for predatory striped bass and black bass, and in the same project, having habitat for endangered Delta smelt and habitat for endangered Chinook salmon. And it should, to me, just show like, holy smokes, you could actually bring this stuff together. It started off with these two groups that had done things in the same way for so long, and they were dug in. They had their orthodoxies. And as soon as those were broken down and challenged a little bit, came up with this idea that is really exciting and meets the goals of water quality and endangered species, and endangered species protection. Kind of along those same lines, we talked about this tunnel project called the Delta Conveyance Project. We kind of took this idea of having stakeholder engagement, people who would say, no chance, we are never putting a tunnel in the Delta. Um, and they asked those folks, they said, look, um, granted, I, we know that you, know, you don't want this tunnel. You don't have to be for this project, but with your local knowledge and your expertise, if this project were to go in, what are some of the ways that it could that we could decrease the impacts and maybe even find some common benefit? And this was a really touchy thing for folks because they identified, you know, their their communities were all about no tunnels, no way, never. And this idea of still being opposed to the tunnels, but taking a step forward and saying, okay, if they go in, you really need to consider all this stuff before you think about plunking a tunnel in here. Um, and the process has continued to a point where there's now a proposal for what's called a community benefits plan, where the folks who are actually using and buying that water near and far, um, that there might be money that's used that's completely unrelated to mitigation or any other regulatory stipulations, but there's money for other benefits for the community in the realization that, yeah, this project, if it happens, might 
change the character of the place that these people call home. So how can we facilitate um, adapting, accommodating a new character, a changed character or whatever? So it's just been a fascinating idea of these, these two groups, no tunnels, yes tunnels. How can you think the tunnels are a bad idea? How can you think the tunnels are a good idea? Bringing them together in such a way that it may not be successful, it may not ever happen, but at least you're starting to get an idea of new ways forward by challenging those previous ways of doing business. Endangered species, this idea is not necessarily new, but we, you know, when we have an endangered species, um, it, you know, it's, it, it, um, we have to protect those species. We have to come up with plans to protect those species because this society values that. We, we value species diversity. It has brought us great riches and we, we, we want to keep that going. And it's hard to question, but management plans that just focus on species, if we just focus on the species, we've always called them the canary in the coal mine because they are indicative of a larger system. But if we, let's say it's Delta smelt, and we eradicate all the non-native fish and we bring back Delta smelt, we will have achieved that goal, but will the, at what cost? What will it mean to economies? What will it mean to people who live there? What will it mean to recreation? And what will it mean to perhaps other native species that aren't endangered? Will the, is it guaranteed that the entire system improves if just the species improves? Again, I don't know, but these are, are questions that might be worth asking um, that maybe we'd be looking at reconciled areas um, or what Peter Moyle, a professor out of UC Davis, calls naturalized species. That we're not gonna bring back that Delta that was here 150, 180, 200 years ago. So how do we reconcile the system that we've done, that we had, that we've made with um, wanting to have a diverse, broad functioning uh, ecosystem. And we talked about changing the time horizon again, but you know, we make five year plans, we make one year plan, things like that. We have, we have longer term plans as well. But again, we're thinking about how, how uh, ecosystems and how our park lands, and just the land all around us has changed and dramatic changes in, in what historically is a short period of time but they're longer than human lifespans. So we're thinking that things have changed and it's taken 30, 50, 100 years to change those. Maybe we need to start looking at those plans in a different way that we start looking at the longer term than even we're, we're often afforded to. Um, there's a fellow named E.O. Wilson, he's a biologist and he's been an author, he's a famous eco, um, uh, ecologist out of, uh, he's at Harvard. And um, he has this idea called the half earth, is that if half the earth remains as functional thriving ecosystem, then we'll be okay. It doesn't have to be wilderness, but a lot of it does have to be wilderness, not all of it does, but it has to be functioning ecosystem. Something that big requires a long-term way. And when I say we'll be okay, it means we'll be, that the earth will still be able to accommodate us um, in ways that we want to over time. Um, this is all to say, should we be saving the function of a system over the form of the system? So if the function of say the Delta that we want is to provide habitat and to uh, provide uh, water and bring back endangered species and such, does it have to look like an old Delta or can it look like something new? And if we have that way of looking at something new, uh, just providing the function of the ecosystem, we might be able to shorten that time horizon. It all depends on how we want to define restoration. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through this one. I think we'll be done in just a minute here or two. Over at uh, Big Break, where I work, um, it's a very sandy area. The soil is really sandy out there. And there was this plant community that thrived for eons out in that part of, of northern San Joaquin Valley, eastern Contra Costa County, uh, the, the uh, San Joaquin Delta sand dune plant community. And as more development went out there and more land was reclaimed for agriculture and such, you know, that community just took a beating 
And there are small areas where it still thrives, like the Antioch Dunes National Wildlife Re uh, area, Refuge. And um, so we have this fellow named Chris Thayer. He was this botanist. He used to walk around the park. And I didn't know him, but I, I met him one day. And he was all about sand dunes. This was his driving force in life was sand dunes. And he said, you know, we could restore sand dunes out here. It'd be so great. And he, he, had, he envisioned this thing that was like a museum piece, a fence around it. Nobody goes in. We only have trained professionals going and pulling in weeds, providing treatments, all that kind of stuff. It's like, Chris, this is, a, this is one of those, you know, entry level parks where people are bringing their dogs out, their families, and, you know, it's not really part of the land use plan out here. But could we maybe set aside an area and have the community get involved with this thing? They're not going to be trained experts. It's going to be a mess. We're going to have really weedy times. We're going to have times when people who said they're going to come out and volunteer and pull weeds are not going to show up. It's going to be kind of a mess. And so Mr. Thayer was all about it being the plant community, plant that community. And our end was more about the community side. It's a plant community. Can we develop a community that will take care of these plants? So we we're sacrificing this perfect for the broader good of both. This is an endangered ecosystem. It needs protection. So that, in a lot of folks' minds, says fence it off, protect it, keep people away from it, keep the dogs out, keep the cats out and all. Um, in another person's mind, it's like, this is a park. This is a directed multi-use park. People want to walk around there. They want to take their dog off leash where they can. And so are those things necessarily antagonistic? And we're finding out here, no, not necessarily. It's certainly not beautiful all the time, but boy, when it thrives, like you see in this picture here, when you have these this plant community in blossom and thinking that you're bringing back this little piece that was long thought lost, it's incredibly satisfying, very gratifying. And I guess, you know, when it comes to this, as conservation, as stewards and land managers and such, what are we actually doing? Are we pushing people, pushing society, pushing ideas into the kind of conservation that we think is appropriate. Just pushing there, pushing there, pushing there, like Sisyphus trying to push that rock up the hill. Or are we setting up opportunities for folks to be the conservationists and the stewards that they are being inexorably pulled toward our plan? It's two different ways of looking at it, two different orthodoxies. And is there somewhere along that spectrum where we find the future of conservation? That is that. So I have done a lot of yakking, which I've known to, been known to do, but I am happy to please field anybody's questions if they would like, any comments, any thoughts. Again, it's, you know, this is not finished and developed in my mind, but I'd love to hear any questions that folks might have. And I'll stop sharing the screen. If you have a question, uh, just unmute yourself and ask away. Thank you. No questions? Anybody? Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, I, my video is not working. This is Steve Moore. Um, hey, Steve. You, hi. Uh, great conversation. Um, this touches on a lot of stuff, and uh, yeah. I don't really have a specific directed question, but um, I've heard lots of con conversation and read a lot of the bit like, what is quote unquote natural? What is quote oh, yeah. unquote the original, uh, if that is even a desired result? And you, this is what you've been speaking to uh, uh, for a full hour here. Mm -hmm. um, a thought that I have uh, is like, if we go back to pre-European uh, ancestry entry, uh, then uh, what was the quote unquote natural and um, a concept that I've heard at least uh, for one area of California not too long ago is to think that it was pristine wilderness is a misnomer in the first place because it was being quote unquote managed by the natives how far back did that go when uh, to one time I asked a question of an expert and her answer was all the way back to the ice ages when humans entered the picture. And then of course it was a much different regime then. So 
it's uh, this is this is getting really philosophical, and I'm not sure I can state it any differently than that. But that's just it. It's like what is the you know, the, the old uh, conservation group Friends of Earth started by David Brower. If anybody remembers him, they had a, a publication. You can tell by the title of the publication; it's a little dated. It was called Man Apart, and the the, the little slogan line was Man Apart, not Man Apart. And it was man, a next word part, like you were a part of it. And then it was not man apart, apart being one word. And that's really that, that key thing. Is our approach of pulling humans out of the equation of land management, human use, um, is it sustainable? Is it something that, uh, you, you know, there are just different sides of it. Some people can say it's the right way to go. Some people can say it's not the way to go. Is there something in between um, but this is the kind of stuff that I don't have an answer for. You know, I, I think, oh, in this place, I don't want to see anybody, except, of course, me. And in other places, you know, I want to see a bunch of people. I want to see kids playing Frisbee. I want to, you know, see them riding bikes. And, and I want to see somebody out there duck hunting. Um, you know, different, those, those active interactions with the land. Um, and do they all have to be pristine waters? I don't know. I don't know. Thanks. And thank you. Uh, interestingly enough, I think not man apart. That might be a bit tail back to a poet named Robertson Jeffers. I oh, think. thank you. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so does anybody have, like, what do you think your park or your you know, place that connects you to the land, you know, where along the spectrum do you find that? Yeah, David. Um, so I spent uh, 20 years and I still live at, at Mono Lake, though I've retired oh, in Mo nice. Mono Lake Tufa State Reserve. And mm -hmm. the effort in the um, early 80s, especially to to save Mono Lake from a, a process of, you know, the big city in L.A. taking water and changing the, the ecosystem. One of the debates early on by the Mono Lake Committee and the other folks was, well, if we create a state park, we create a national monument here. Um, now there's a national forest scenic area. We're going to bring people to a place that not very many people go to now, and we love it that way. But they they made a, a pretty big decision back then that uh, it has worked out, which was that if nobody knows about a place, not if not enough people know about a place, they won't care about it. And if enough people can learn about it by visiting or by the uh, other media, um, that, that's really how Mona Lake was saved, is, is a, a major, a major, major part of the effort was um, getting these two agencies here and, and to work with now over, you know, um, uh, three quarters of a million people pretty much uh, most years wow. ago through and and managing it it's a big place so it can handle it can handle you know ranges of, of some places are not uh, people don't are not told about and and you know they have to find them on their own other places are the main places that people are sent to so there's a whole range there of management and this is just one example of, of I mean you you touch as, as Steve said you touched on many different elements of a of a philosophical process that uh, that is important but that's that's my story. Yeah, and how do you actually reconcile all those things? And you do imperfectly at one particular park. You know, no, nothing's perfect, but you try to accommodate those different things as best you can, knowing the resources, knowing the the human use patterns. Great. So, Thanks Mike. Lot, yes. Here, a lot of what you discussed. I mean in one form or another goes back to the whole start of the parks movement and what parks are supposed to represent. And you look at Yosemite in the start of the national parks, it's John Muir, Stephen Mather, the state parks movement that also gave rise to your agency. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are questions that continually are being asked and it's just good to see a refreshing take on these questions. That's great. Yeah, thank you. I just, you know, 
it's a funny thing because I'm a very traditional guy. I like tradition. I really do. But orthodoxy, which could, might be uh, defined as a, as a, you know, worshiping traditions, like I don't like orthodoxies. I don't like the set way of doing things. I just figure there's always some other way of doing things and, and the way that, that works at a particular time and space in society and in the state of the earth at the time might work beautifully. But things evolve and change. And I just wonder if it's worthwhile, you know, constantly questioning and adapting and tweaking things at the edges or at the very core, you know? And so what do we do for parks? Like you were saying, I'm at that when you go with, um, something like, you know, Stephen Mather or the National Park Service and things like that. And these huge grand landscapes you didn't want to lose. Um, and then you have, not that many decades later, Philip Burton saying, no, we want to, we want to get, go and get National Recreation Area and Gateway in New Jersey and these places like that. Very different from very different times. That's a great point. Thank you. And then uh uh, for, not just for you, if you haven't read it, but for the audience, a really good book to, that would tie into your presentation is On Certain Past by William Tweed. Say it again, please. It's a what? It's On Certain Path uh, by William oh. Tweed. He was the longtime park historian for Sequoia Kings Canyon. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you. And Amy just uh, included the info on that on in the chat. So, oh, awesome. I hope I Thank spelled you. it right. Yes, you did. He was actually one of our. We had him as a speaker at our conference in 2016. Oh wow! But, so, it's just good to. Your presentation was outstanding. So we want to thank you for that. And thank you. Just brings up a lot of things we as people who work in parks need to consider. Yeah, and there's a lot. <laughs> there's always a lot, yeah. Um, I, I know we're at noon right now, folks. I want to respect everybody's time. I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us, for giving some thought to this, for listening to me prattle on for 50 minutes and, and for being accommodating with my computer problems earlier on. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you folks are here. I'm glad the conference is thriving. It does good for my heart to see the business is really all about doing the business, doing good business and doing good. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much for coming, Mike. Sure, my pleasure. And I don't know if, if it's worth sticking around, if people want to keep chatting, that's fine with me. Whatever you want me to do, cut out or stick around, I'm happy.